we have been working through the book of Psalms, not every psalm and not the book in its entirety, but getting a sense and a feel of how the psalms work. And certainly um, we are uh, just wrapping up book four. We're still in the fourth book. If you remember how the psalms work, uh, book three is really the book that in the center, which talks for the most part, uh, gives that kind of that flavor of the psalms that we think of quite often. And it's just the, the crying out of our hearts, oh Lord, where are you? Where are you when it hurts? Why are the wicked prospering? What is going on in the world? Book four seeks to answer the questions of book three, in a sense. And each one of the Psalms comes back to, to declare God's rule and sovereign power even over wickedness and even over evil. And that is really the crux of what Psalm 94 is about. It is uh, a classic text that responds to that question of evil. I don't know if you have recognized that the world seems sometimes to be falling apart. We always wonder uh, how much worse things can be and how much worse things can go. And Psalm 94 is a place to turn to uh, when we're looking for those kind of answers and comfort. You know the pattern if you've been with us. This is often how a psalm can be charted out. Verse 1 and the last verse of the psalm quite frequently, not every psalm, the psalmists, uh, the writers of the psalms like to keep us on our toes. There is no perfect pattern, but often this is the way with psalms. The first verse and the last verse are connected to each other. And in fact, this is very, very clear in this psalm. And then there is a middle verse a point, a center point in the verse, and in this case, it is exactly in the middle. It is verse 12. We see this, this pattern very plainly with these verses. When you look at this, Psalm 1, or sorry, verse 1, O God of vengeance, shine forth, verse 23, the Lord will wipe them out. You can see the connection between the call for vengeance and then the response, the Lord our God will wipe them out. This is the connection, the beginning the end, and in the middle, we have this very interesting, almost curious middle verse that, in a sense, feels like a completely different verse from the text. Blessed is the man whom you discipline, O Lord, and whom you teach out of your law. What has that got to do with wickedness in the world, calling for God's justice, looking for God's vengeance, God coming to deal with his enemies, and in the middle of the psalm, blessed is the man whom you discipline. And it's the way the psalms are, so frequently written to constantly catch us short. Just when we think we know where the psalm is going, just when we think we understand the pattern and what's happening, he throws in a completely, apparently to our eyes, a random thought. But there is actually a connection, a distinct connection. And in fact, it is the hinge on which the psalm rides. Everything from up to verse 12 leads to that. Everything from verse 12 comes down to verse 23. You know the pattern. You've been with us many times and you're tired of hearing me talk about it. But it is good to understand how the psalms work because when we come to them by ourselves, we look for that, we get the sense of the framework, and we begin to pull it apart. The Psalms, I've said this every week, and I'm saying it again, Hebrew poetry is designed to slow us down. It is intentionally positioned, words are positioned, phrases are such that they make us pause and think and ruminate and chew and pull it apart. This is the work, the labor, the beauty of Hebrew poetry. Psalm 94. O oh Lord, God of vengeance, O oh God of vengeance, Shine forth. You can hear the repetition. That is, of course, a very uh, typical Hebrewism, if that's a proper word. It is a way of emphasizing something. If I want to have you know what this is about, or what I want to declare, or what you need to hear, then I'm going to say it twice. Oh Lord, God of vengeance, God of vengeance. There's a repetition there. This is the call. Shine forth. This is calling on God to respond, to move, to act. Now, I don't know how you hear, feel when you hear those kind of words, God of vengeance, God of vengeance. It sounds kind of unbecoming to our New Testament ears. We think of verses like Matthew 5, for example, verse 43 to 45, Jesus said, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. He's quoting now the 
talk of the day, not the scriptures. Shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. So what do we do with the psalm that begins with the psalmist calling on us as it were to call on God, oh God of vengeance, God of vengeance. And at the same time, we know in scripture that we are called to love our enemies. We read in Romans 12, 19, beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. How do you reconcile the fact that the Bible tells us to leave things to God, to not call for vengeance, to not look for vengeance, to love your enemy, and the psalmist begins, God of vengeance, come and do something. Shine forth. Part of our struggle with reconciling this is our notion of human anger. We think of vengeance in very human terms. We often think in terms that we know we have been upset. We have had a moment when we have just wanted to smash something in anger and frustration and just take it out. And sometimes in that moment, it feels so right. It feels so justified. It feels good. And sometimes we think when we hear the Bible talking about God responding in vengeance, we take and project what we think about vengeance, and we assume God must be feeling those same emotions. He's had someone cut him off in traffic, and he wants to get even. God of vengeance! God of vengeance! That's not what the text is saying. And when we look at the text and think of it through our human grid of what it means to be angry and to be upset, we completely misunderstand what we're talking about when we talk about God's vengeance. Vengeance is right. Revenge is wrong. Vengeance is God's reaction, his righteous reaction to wickedness and to evil. Let me give you a sense of human vengeance. The picture behind me is a picture of a pile of shoes. You may have seen these before. This is an Auschwitz. This pile of shoes represents those who never wore them once they were removed from their body. And every one of those shoes represents somebody who lost their life at the hands of a maniac who believed because of their genetic makeup and their birthplace that they were not worthy to be called human beings. Now, how do we respond to that kind of evil and wickedness and foolish thinking that destroys the lives of the innocent. Do you not feel your heart rising up with vengeance, the need for righteous judgment to fall on those who deserve what's coming to them? There is nothing wrong with a response to evil that is based in the truth of God. And that is what the psalmist is doing. He is calling on the righteous appeal to God's justice. God of justice, you are the one who responds to wickedness. I am calling you, this is what the psalmist is doing, the world is in chaos. Why are you so passive? Why are you not responding? God of vengeance, God of vengeance, shine forth. Rise up, O oh judge of the earth. This is the call of the heart cry as he begins this psalm. He is calling on God's response in perfect justice against wickedness. Rise up, O oh judge of the earth. Repay to the proud what they deserve. This is the kind of heart cry that you see and we hear and read about in Revelation 6, for example. Those who have died and who are standing before the throne in heaven, we see this glimpse. Verse 9 of Revelation 6, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they bore. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? 
How long before your justice will fall? How long before our deaths, which shouldn't have taken place, we were murdered innocently, how long before these people who got away with it will finally be judged? That's the call in Revelation 6. That's the call of, that we're reading of in Psalm 94. And this is really the heart cry of the church. This is the way that the, the whole entire Bible ends. The second last verse of scripture, Revelation 21 verse 20. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. And what is the church's response to that phrase when Jesus says, surely I am coming soon. They say in their hearts, as collectively as God's people, we live out this truth. Amen. That's a single sentence, by the way. All you have to say, full stop. I'm coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Come soon. Amen. And what are we saying when church cries out? We are saying, put an end to this nonsense. Bring an end to this wickedness. Rise up, O judge of the earth. Show your vengeance on those who are your enemies. The righteous response of God. So this psalm, in a sense, is our psalm. This is still how the church believes and thinks, and we look forward to that day. And I hope we can separate our own personal vendettas. That's not what this is about. It is not your personal feelings that have been hurt. And so now you're praying that God will strike somebody with lightning so you feel good about yourself. That's not what this is. It is that God would be glorified. That his name would stop, to be, stop being trampled. That his name would stop being sullied. That his reputation would stop being put down. That God would once and for all be seen as God. That the glory of God would be known in the earth. How long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked, you hear the repetition? He is asking himself the question because it seems to go on indefinitely. How long shall the wicked exult? How many times do we have to watch the news and see somebody else has got it in a vehicle and drove through a public square to knock down people just because of their religion or their point of view? How long do we have to hear about somebody who planted a bomb somewhere and some innocent people were destroyed? How many times do we have to hear stories of people who got weapons and went into a public place and did what they did. How many times do we have to hear story after story after story? How long? That's the question. How long? Where's this going to go? How does this play out? What's the end of this all? Does it ever end? What's the end game? How much worse could it be? We always ask ourselves these questions as we're flipping off the television after watching the news. How much worse could it get? What kind of laws are we passing now? Where is this world going? That's what he's asking. Lord, why are you being passive when we long for you to response, to, re to react, to respond to the wickedness? And then he begins to describe the kind of wickedness that he sees, unlike, not unlike what we see in our day. They pour out their arrogant words. All the evildoers boast. Seems all the more especially in our culture in the Western world, it would seem, at least to me, that we have gotten so emboldened to rally against anything to do with God. He is so pushed out of the public square that if you should perhaps even consider God in your conversation, you are relegated to be some sort of a lower class intelligence. Clearly, God has nothing to do with real life. And they, in their arrogant words, speak as if they can live the only reason they do exist and continue to exist is because God allows them to continue to exist. But in their arrogance, they speak against God as if he is a small thing. Here's a quote you can find on the internet labeled by to, uh, to Bill Murray. Religion is the worst enemy of mankind. No single war in the history of humanity has killed as many people as religion has. Not to mention, it has sit, set science back by a thousand years. I can't even begin to dismantle the foolishness of this statement. It is so untrue on so many levels that it's hard to even justify commenting on a comment like that. But this is the kind of rhetoric that constantly is regurgitated amongst internet atheists. And by the way, this is exactly their scheme, and this is how it goes. If you're interested at all, 
this is not a quote by Bill Murray. This is not anything he has ever said. But this is exactly how it works when all you're interested in is promoting a, a point of view and tearing down another point of view by thinking somehow that you've got some statistic that has absolutely nothing to do with whether or not God exists. This could actually be true, and that is irrelevant to whether or not God exists. That is the question. And this is exactly how the kind of arrogance of our culture works, that all we do is have to find a face that somehow carries some barbed piece of wire, throw it out into the culture, and people believe it because it's connected to somebody that I know. And this is a complete falsehood as a quote. This is exactly the kind of disingenuous nonsense that goes on, and if you're familiar with the uh, commonplace internet atheist work, that's pretty much par for the course. It's pretty much high school juvenile behavior. But it's the kind of arrogant words that are constantly being poured out, and it's just the way we live. They crush your people, O oh Lord, and afflict your heritage. God, he's reminding them, God, we are caught up in this. We are your people. We are your heritage. If we belong to you, you should respond to us. Verse 6, they kill the widow and the sojourner the mur and murder the fatherless. You see, whether you take this to be that he's talking about literal events that he knows of, but regardless, he's talking about those who are disenfranchised, those who are on the fringes, the weak. That culture would be the widow, the sojourner, just the guy passing by, passing through the country. They murder the fatherless, those who have no defense. This, they're attacking at every kind. They don't, it's random. They, they don't, they look for the weak. They look for the opportunities and they attack. And they say, the Lord does not see. The God of Jacob does not perceive. This is part of their arrogant words. We can do whatever we want. The God in heaven, he's a joke. The God of, of Christianity, he doesn't do anything. And they misinterpret God's patience and loving kindness to be his passive acceptance of their wicked behavior. And so the psalmist responds to their foolishness. Oh, understand, oh, dullest of people. The tone now changes. Now, he's talked about what the wicked are like and how they behave and how evil has the upper hand and what it's doing. And now he's responding back to them as if he could speak to them as if they're listening. The word dullest there, actually, in the Hebrew, interestingly enough, the root noun idea of this word is the word for beast. It's the word for animal. Oh, Stupid beast is kind of the root idea. Oh, dumb donkey is kind of the thought. Oh, dullest of the people. This is a, a straight up insult. You are so stupid in your arrogance to think that evil is acceptable, to think that you will get away with evil, to think that evil is a lifestyle that has an end of itself, to think that there's nothing wrong with what you're doing, to think that your behavior will go unchecked and unnoticed. Oh, you stupid fool, you dullest of the people, fools, when will you be wise? When will you not just use the most basic thinking? He asks these rhetorical questions. Hugh planted the ear. Does he not hear? I mean, it's, it's a basic question. I think you know the answer. If God gave you ears, do you think, he's basically saying, do you think he doesn't have ears? Do you think he's going to be completely deaf, has no idea what you're saying, but he says to himself, I'm going to create something that can hear. No. It's as an argument from the lesser to the greater, from the greater to the lesser. If it's true of him, it's going to be true of you. If it's true of you, it's going to be true of him. If you can hear, what makes you think that God Almighty can't hear everything you say? He who formed the eye, same argument. Does he not see? So if God, if you have eyes, if God gave you eyes, what would make you think that he doesn't see you in the dark? That he doesn't know your every thought, see your every deed, watch where everywhere where you go, see everything that you do. Oh, wicked, foolish man, what makes you think you escape the eye of God? What makes you think that your wickedness, because God is passive and not doing anything, and because you and your arrogant words stand up against him, what makes you think 
that he is not keeping account of you and watching everything you do. How stupid are you to carry on in wickedness, to carry on in your foolishness? He who disciplines nations, this is again an argument from the greater to the lesser. If he's going to deal with a country, that's a thinking of the day and certainly what the psalmist points out, if he doesn't if he's going to deal with an entire nation and wipe out a people who is wicked, what makes you think you're going to get away with your little petty stupidity? What in the world is in your head that you think you're not going to be rebuked? An argument from the greater to the lesser. He who teaches man knowledge. Now, I don't like mathematics, but I can tell you something. I know that God is a genius because mathematics exists in this world on a level that I do not understand that go beyond my scope of grasping how it is that you can write down on paper exactly what's going to happen before you do it. I mean, the physics of this world are so perfect that if you know the weight of an object, the distance it's going to travel, the velocity it's going to move at, you can predict exactly, exactly, exactly. I have a friend uh, where to land, what's going to happen. I have a friend who's a pilot. He's told me, that airplanes are built on mathematics. I'm just repeating what I was told. If I'm wrong, you can shoot me later. I, I'm just telling you what he told me. That they are built with such precision that the pilot knows he could go out to the runway and put a dime on the runway. It, it, doing all the calculations of wind speed, what's the wind is coming at him, how much Wait, he has all the calculations, I don't know what they are, and figure out the exact moment that that plane will leave the ground. It is a guaranteed moment because by the laws of physics, it has to happen. Because the world is built on mathematics. Why am I rambling about this? Because I am constantly fascinated at the genius mind of God teaches man knowledge. Do you have any sense of anything about this world? Did you make up the laws of mathematics? Do you know why that works? God built that into this world. If he is smarter than you, that's what he's saying. The God who gave knowledge to us. Do you think you can outsmart him? Do you think you've got some way around getting away with your wickedness? He who teaches man knowledge, the Lord, he knows the thoughts that they are but a breath compared to God. You're nothing. His knowledge, his understanding, what he grasps, we are pipsqueaks. And he's just responding to the wicked. Who do you think you are, a wicked man, who behaves so stupidly? Do you think God doesn't know what you're doing? Do you think you're going to get away with this? And now verse 12. This middle verse that's very curious. That almost seems to come give you whiplash in the middle of the text. Blessed is the man whom you discipline, O Lord. Whom you teach out of your law. What does that have to do with the wicked and vengeance and calling on vengeance on those who are getting away with wickedness? What? Does it make you confused? It's a delicious verse. It makes you stop and ponder and consider. Welcome to the Psalms. The word blessed, that simply is the same word that we find at the very first word of the entire book of Psalms. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. It's that word that means to be, that have that deep settled peace, that contentment, the joy and satisfaction of your heart. It goes beyond just mere happiness. Blessed is the man whom you discipline. Wow. I don't enjoy discipline. When your mother disciplined you, did you enjoy it? When your father took you out to the woodshed, assuming that that happened, and if it didn't, can I say politely, it probably should have. <laughs> Did you enjoy that in the moment? Probably not. But you know the truth of the matter is, what happens when you are disciplined? What happens when you are rebuked? You learn the right way. Thank the Lord, is what he's saying, that you have directed me away from the path of the wicked. 
Thank you, Lord, that I am content because you have trained my life. Every time I thought this was the way to live, you spanked me with your word. Blessed are you who teach, teach you out of the law. The word of God has taught me is what he's rejoicing in in this moment. That that could be me and should be me by nature. But God, you have been gracious to me. You have taught me, you have spanked me into a different road. You have disciplined me into a different way of thinking. You have helped me to see how to live. He's not claiming to be perfect, but he's claiming to understand righteousness. And can I say and insert, being the New Testament believers that we are, any righteousness that we call on and see in the Old Testament to us is simply a reflection of the righteousness the alien righteousness that is ours by being united with Christ. We have no righteousness of our own. It is only found in him. Blessed is the man whom you discipline, whom you train, whom you keep from that foolishness. To give him rest. What do we find in the word? What happens? What's the response when we find ourselves blessed by being disciplined and trained in how to live? You give our hearts peace in the days of trouble. That's us right now turning off the television, wondering where this is going, how much more can we take, what kind of wickedness is going to build on top of wickedness, what happens? Our hearts know a rest and a peace in the days of trouble. There is a place that we go to that we recognize and acknowledge he is still on the throne and judgment day is coming. He gives them rest and then this delicious poetic phrase until, the, until a pit is dug for the wicked. I just love that phrase. I'm not even sure why. I just think it's so poetic. A pit, it's just picture words. Nobody's going to dig a pit, literally, and make all the wicked fall into it, but that's the picture. Until finally, once and for all, the bad guys are going to get what's coming to them. There is rest in the days of trouble. Those are the days right now until we wait for that day. The day. Whatever day God has appointed. But we are waiting and we rest and we know that day is coming. Oh God of vengeance rise up. Verse 14. For the Lord will not forsake his people. This is a reminder to us. An encouragement to us. In the midst of the evil that we see around us. When we feel overwhelmed. The Lord will not forsake his people. He will not abandon his heritage. Though we feel overwhelmed and definitely the minority. The laughing stock of the culture. The, the, the bottom of anybody's shoe. I mean the, the ridiculous state that you would declare that Christ is Lord of your life and that makes a difference. And that you too must bow the knee to Christ. The foolishness of a message in a culture that rises up in arrogance against God. The Lord will not forsake his people, for justice will return to the righteous, and all the upright in heart will follow it. Who rises up for me against the wicked? Question, answer, nobody except the Lord. Who stands up for me against evildoers? Question, answer, nobody except the Lord. Nobody's going to respond for me. If, if he doesn't do it, we have no hope. If the Lord had not been my help, my soul would have lived in the land of silence. Wow. What is the land of silence? Anyone ever visited the land of silence? What kind of a vacation destination is that? What a great poetic phrase. If the Lord had not been my help, no one's going to come to rescue me. Evil is going to overwhelm me. This is only going to get worse and worse and worse. If, if God doesn't respond then I'm going to be swallowed up. But God is not going to forsake his inheritance, his, his inheritance, his heritage. He's, he's going to rise up. If he doesn't, who's going to come? If the Lord had not been my help, I would have gone, I think the land of silence is what? You're the grave. I, that's what I read here. I would just soon have lived. I mean, it's just a poetic way to say the place where nobody talks, the place where you can't hear a thing, the place where nothing goes on, the place where nothing happens, evil would have its day and would win. Verse 18, when I thought, my foot slips. I mean, we're going down. 
we're going to disappear. They're going to wipe us out. They're, they're going to become greater and stronger and more powerful. My foot slips. When I thought that, your steadfast love, O oh Lord, held me up. When the cares of my heart are many, your consolations cheer my soul. This is his response now. He's acknowledging and recognizing and seeing that although evil has the upper hand, he's recognizing that God is still on our side. And though he seems to be passive and he doesn't respond the way we would like to respond, though he doesn't move when we want him to move, though he works on an entirely different agenda, though he has an entirely different response to react in vengeance, that he doesn't react flying off the handle like we would like him to, though he has an entirely different history in mind, we recognize that these things, knowing this, it cheers our souls. It comforts us when I'm overwhelmed with anxiety. Can wicked rulers be allied with you? Rhetorical question. Those who frame injustice by statute. This puts me in mind of the laws of our age that have made what is righteous evil and what is evil good. That has turned the whole thing upside down and turn the culture on its head. Can wicked rulers be allied with you? The answer is no. Those who frame injustice, they actually pass laws to make things that are wicked legal. This puts me in mind of something else in verse 21. They band together against the life of the righteous. They've passed laws now so that the righteous will be silenced or will be snuffed out or will be kept at bay or will be pushed into the periphery. They, they pass laws so that wickedness can have the upper hand and they condemn the innocent to death. It just puts me in mind, if not you uh, perhaps, but it, it makes me think of abortion, which is legal in our country. They pass laws to put to death the innocent. What part of the human body doesn't stop and digest that thought that there's an evil inherent in that very notion. How is it that we as human beings think that this is acceptable behavior for us and we have passed laws to make that okay? There is something demented at the core of the human psyche that makes every excuse under the sun why that is acceptable behavior. And we pass laws to make it right. What kind of evil do we live in? But the Lord has become my stronghold. My God, the rock of my refuge. He will bring back on them their iniquity. And wipe them out for their wickedness. The Lord our God will wipe them out. This is not us rejoicing that there's a place that God calls hell. This is not our, us excited because finally that guy at work that we can't stand is going to get what's coming to him. This is not what this is. This is the God of justice, the God of glory, finally getting and responding to the wickedness that has been against his nature, against his character, against his glory, against his creation, that has destroyed what he has made. This is God responding and justifying and declaring his own name to be right. This is what the church is longing for. Even so, come Lord Jesus. We are looking forward to the day when God will once and for all, not to make ourselves feel good, not because we're finally going to get what we want. No, because God is finally going to be seen as God when every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, every created being will finally acknowledge that they were created in the image of God, created with God's design in mind, not for us to make up our own decisions about God's design, not to live our lives however we want to and think that we can live 
scot-free, with no response from God, from our Creator, living our lives any way we want, justified and free, do whatever we want, pass all the laws we want, make ourselves feel good about ourselves, and never be held to account. That is not how life works. And God will respond to His enemies. This is the comfort that we find in Psalm 94. 